Uh, as I begin, I would like to pray as we do this. Our Father, this morning, um, I just thank you that uh, you uh, send men and prepare men to uh, share the gospel, to serve your people, to lead them, to guide them, and to love them. Lord, we just thank you for Pastor Mark and his family and the way they serve us here in the church uh, and serving you. So I pray that you will bless them, give us ideas, uh, spur our minds in ways that we can serve them as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So um, as I begin, uh, I want to acknowledge that some of the material that I'm going to share with you is taken from a pamphlet written by Richard W. DeHaan. And... um, that may be a familiar name for you. Richard DeHaan is the son of uh, Dr. M. R. DeHaan and the father of Rick and Mark DeHaan. They are the founders of the Daily Bread. And so uh, that might be familiar to you if you read the Daily Bread. That's uh, one thing that Teresa and I do uh, faithfully every day. We enjoy it a lot. So... Um, to begin with, I, want, uh, I really would like to share two experiences that I had as a new believer uh, concerning my pastors uh, as a new believer. And sharing these experiences with you may give you insight into my attitudes and actions toward my pastors. Some of you may say, so that's why he says this and that's why he does that when he comes to attitudes toward pastors. These experiences have certainly colored my opinions. My first pastor as a believer was Reverend Wayne Schwab. He was a big man, 6'4", 6'6", I don't know, but he was a very, very large man with a bigger heart. Reverend Schwab took me under his wing. We didn't do any Bible studies or programs for discipleship because he wasn't there long. But he did ask me to help in some remodeling in a garage for a youth center. He also asked me to go with him uh, to different kinds of places. And I suppose you could call it lifestyle discipleship. It was a great experience for me to see the way he uh, worked with people who were unbelievers and people who were outside in our community. It was really a great experience for me in that way. Um, After a couple of months, I think it was, it's our... I don't remember. It's been a long time ago. Uh, I was asked to be a member of the governing board as an athletic director. I didn't realize what I was getting into. (laughs) It wasn't very long into my term as a board member that two of our governing board members brought a complaint to the board. Apparently, Reverend Schwab, who liked to find bargains at garage sales, purchased some paint, five 10, 20 gallons, I, I, I don't recall. For the youth center and some classrooms in the church building. Now, I don't know if he was purchasing the paint or if it was just the peach color that they were opposed to. <laughs> that was the only thing they thought was an imperfection. Or was that the only thing they thought was an imperfection in his personality? I'm sure it wasn't, because once you find that little area of disagreement, it's easy to find more. These two main men made it so difficult for Reverend Schwab that he resigned shortly after, and I was in a fog. I couldn't believe that so-called mature Christian leaders would do something so minor, would use something so minor and insignificant as peach paint to pressure a pastor to resign. I praise God that he protected me and kept my faith secure in him. It would have been easy to fall away because of the actions of those two men. And may I say at this point, be careful. One disagreement builds on another until you have something so big it is nearly impossible to navigate. If you'll hang with me just a little bit longer, I have one more example. We eventually got another pastor. His name was Reverend Peter Burkhart. He had been a missionary to the Philippines, and I thought, we can't get any better than this. But it wasn't very long, and the same two men accused Reverend Burkhart of lying. 
they brought a tape recorder to the governing board meeting. They were going to catch him in a lie. You think things went smoothly? It went downhill from there. It wasn't very long, and Reverend Peter Burkhart resigned. Not once um, did I see or hear either one of these men use Scripture to justify their actions. I believe if these two men would have put themselves into a pastor's shoes for a week or two, they would have thought differently. There also seemed to be the mentality that a pastor shouldn't be paid more than the lowest paid person in the church. Even though the pastor had seven years of college, four-year degree, and three years of seminary, I think their prayer attitude was, Lord, keep our pastor humble and we'll keep him poor. Now that you've gotten a taste of my experience, let's look at uh, the message that I have prepared for today. In the Gospel of John, three things are said about John the Baptist. If these three things were kept in mind by each pastor and every member of his congregation, a lot of the difficulty experienced in our churches today could be avoided. In um, John chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. There are three significant things mentioned in these verses about John the Baptist. First, we are told that there came a man. He was a human being, subject to the same weaknesses and limitations as other people. John was born of a woman and had a human father. John was was not an angel. He was no supernatural creation. He was not a hyperphysical emissary from the throne of God. Rather, as God's word states, there came a man. Second, we are told that there came a man sent from God. Although a man with human limitations, John was distinguished and set apart from others and that he was specially chosen one. He was a man sent from God. And third, we're told that there came a man who was sent from God as a witness to testify concerning the light. He came to preach Christ, the light of the world. That was John's mission. And verse 8 says, he himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. And from this passage in John 1, we learn the following things about John the Baptist. He was a man. He was a man sent from God. He was a man sent from God to bear witness of the light. These very same things can also be said about all pastors who are genuine in their calling. They are men. They have human limitations. They are men sent from God. They have a divine authorization. They are men sent from God to bear witness of the light. They have a heavenly commission. Now then, let's use the same outline that we considered that we as we consider our pastor, Dr. Mark Trujillo. First, he is a man. All of us, I am sure, have heard occasional comments, something that might go like this. Oh, our pastor is a very good man, but. Oh, our minister is an excellent Bible teacher, but. Our preacher has a wonderful personality. But it seems in spite of his many commendable virtues, there's always that something about them they don't like. He's a capable expositor of the word, they'll say, but such an ineffective evangelist. He's a powerful preacher, but such a poor pastor. He's a good pastor, but not a good preacher. He works well with older folks, they'll say, but young people just don't seem to like him. And on and on and on we might go. Yes, in almost every church, there seems to be at least one or two who, although making favorable comments about the pastor, cannot refrain from also publicly pointing out shortcomings. And because of this, many of God's servants are waging difficult and discouraging battle. They are doing their best But because of dissension, dissatisfaction, and opposition from those within the church itself, 
the work of the Lord, the suffering. Now, the reason for this, in many instances, is due to a misunderstanding of the nature and work of the pastor. And I want to share with you uh, some 2016 statistics on pastors. 65% of pastors feel their family is in a glass house and fear they are not good enough to meet expectations. No, I didn't um, interview Pastor Mark to get his, but this is general pastors around our country. 35% of pastors feel their churches are in sync to their family needs. 56% of pastors' families are pleased with their church. 24% of families resent the church and its effects on their family. 52% of pastors feel they are are overworked and can't meet their church's unrealistic expectations. 44% of pastors feel their churches are in in sync to ministry agendas. 58% of pastors feel they do not have any good, true friends. 42% of pastors feel their church empowers them to have a life outside the church. 34% of pastors battle discouragement on a regular basis. 66% do not. 35% of pastors battle depression or fear of inadequacy. 65% do not. 27% of pastors stated they have no one to turn to if they are facing a crisis. 73% do. 60% of pastors' wives feel their church treats their family well. 22% of pastors' wives feel the ministry places undue expectations on their family. 26% of pastors' wives feel church is a prime source of stress for their family. 63% of pastors' wives feel finances is a prime source of stress for their family. 45% of pastors spend 10 to 15 hours a week in sermon preparation. 25% 25% spend 15 to 20 hours. 25% less than... Well, I'm lost here, but... But then again, these guys have it down, whereas a more inexperienced pastor may take longer, and a lazy or ineffective pastor will be under 8 hours. Pastors also reported a struggle to create a quality and impacting sermon every week. From my experience, I've got a little bit more. You know, I think, Pastor Mark, you do a great job there. There are, there are always great sermons. 50% of pastors reported they spend on an average of three to four hours a week in needless meetings. And 25% spend more than five hours a week. Seventy-seven percent of pastors spend 20 hours a week or more with their families. And this is significantly up from previous studies. An observation not researched of many pastors today, perhaps 50 percent, is that they are very unhealthy, overweight, with health problems stemming from poor food intake and excessive junk food, a lack of exercise, and to a lesser extent, alcohol. I tell you this to remind you that pastors are men and subject to the same weaknesses and limitations as you and I. Pastor Mark is no angel. (laughs) He is no supernatural creation. He is no hyperphysical emissary from the throne of God. Rather, he is a man. He will have desires, goals he wants to accomplish, things he likes to do, and temptations he will have to face and depend on God to overcome. Just like you and me. He has emotions. He'll experience joy, happiness, sorrow, and anger, the same as you and me. So don't expect Pastor Mark to be the perfect or excel in every area of ministry. And try not to act so shocked when you discover that he's not a combination of outstanding Bible teacher, spirited and effective evangelist, compassionate pastor, inspirational preacher, able administrator, and true businessman. All wrapped up in one person. I remember uh, when Reverend Schwab left, our district superintendent came to help us to find another pastor, and he stood at the front of the group with a blackboard, wanted everybody to give their 
idea of what kind of a pastor that they wanted. And we put all of those things up on the board. And when the last one was put up there, he says, well, it looks to me like you guys are looking for Superman. And it just doesn't happen. With these things in mind, then, I would encourage you to pray for Pastor Mark rather than criticize him. If you have something against him or you think he has something against you, follow biblical guidelines. If you want to encourage Pastor Mark, tell him in person or send an encouragement card and sign it. And I think um, we could do the same thing with Kim to encourage her. If you have a criticism, do not send a, send a card or email delivered in person. And especially, do not send him a harsh, critical, anonymous card or email. Although I think if you send an email, your name is going to be on it. See him in person and be kind. If, however, you have a criticism and you are unwilling to talk to him and you just can't keep it to yourself and you must talk to someone, talk to God. And while you're talking to God, pray for uh, Pastor Mark. If anyone needs the prayers of God's people today, it is the pastors in our churches. Second, Pastor Mark is a man sent from God. When a man has a true calling from God, he has a divine authorization. How do we know a man is sent from God? Because he says so? Because he graduated from an Alliance seminary? Because he has pastored a number of churches? All of these things are helpful. But the way we will know he is a man sent from God is by his message. He believes that the Bible is the infallible word of God. His preaching is faithful to the word of God. He preaches Jesus Christ as the son of God, born of a virgin, who lived a perfect life, died on a cross for the sin of the world, was raised from the dead and ascended to heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father. And when the fullness of time is at hand, will return again to gather his own. In Samuel, uh, in 1 Samuel 26, we can read about the time when David spared the life of King Saul. You might remember this story. We're going to share it in a minute. This is an example of how to treat a man anointed by God. It shows us how careful we should be when dealing with someone appointed by God to a position of trust and responsibility. <clears throat> the Old Testament gives us the setting. David has been chosen to be Israel's next king. But Saul is still on the throne. Motivated by an insane jealousy, Saul hounded David continually, wanting to kill him. And during the darkness one night, David and his company came into Saul's camp while the king and his men were sound asleep. It was perfect setup. David could have put his arch enemy out of the way, but he refused to do so. And here is the record. I want to read that to you. I think I have the right one. No. 26. Okay, here we go. So David and Abishai went to the army by night. And there was Saul, lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner, the soldiers, were lying around him. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of my spear. I won't strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, The Lord himself will strike him. Either his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should, but the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his head and let's go. Now I realize that there's a difference between the king of Israel and our pastor Mark. But even as David so highly respected Saul, the Lord's anointed, so we should be careful not to reach out a hand unjust, unjustly against any man from God, sent from God. If you will pray for our pastor as a man, and show respect for him as a man sent from God, many problems 
uh, will be avoided. The church will have a better image in the community and your children will have a more favorable attitude toward the work of the gospel. We've all heard the phrase unintended consequences, right? So, consider this. Have you, have you uh, heard someone say, I just don't understand why my John and Mary have so little interest in the church since they've grown up. They just don't seem to care about anything anymore. Uh, care about going to church anymore. Is it any wonder, after all the criticism that they've heard, Sunday after Sunday they've had roast preacher for dinner. His sermons were torn apart his pulpit ridiculed by the parents themselves. And then the folks are surprised when Johnny and Mary don't have regard for the church and the pastor. If you have children in your home, be careful about criticizing your pastor. It's our duty as faithful parents to cultivate respect in the minds of our little ones for the office of those men who are sent from God to serve as shepherds of the flock. An unintended consequence of a cavalier attitude toward your pastor may be the contagion of that attitude to, to your children. Not only is it contagious to our children, it is contagious to anyone we might have influence with in the church and even outside the church. One very important way to show your respect for the man and the position he holds is by how you address him and refer to him. When I was young, the pastor would be, be referred to by his degree. For example, Dr. Trujillo. And are you aware? Our pastor has a PhD. And I talked to pastor, it's been years ago. And he doesn't want to be referred to as Dr. Trujillo. So that's okay. Um, as our society, or let's see, at the very least, he would have been referred to as Reverend Trujillo. As our society has become more casual, uh, less respectful in my mind. And that has evolved, or should I say devolved, to pastor, Pastor Mark. Although I use that, and I think that can be appropriate. Or perhaps even just Mark. And I think this is a disservice to the position of a shepherd and overseer. But maybe you can just call me old-fashioned. Third, he is a witness of the light. He is not that light but a witness to it. He has a heavenly commission. The high priority that should be given to the ministry of the word by those servants who servants called of God to preach is made clear in Acts 6. And in this passage, we read about a situation in the early church which, if not handled correctly, could have sidetracked the apostles. And in Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because of their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. As conscientious men, they could not uh, ignore the plight of those poor widows. But they concluded it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. You see, serving tables was not their work. That isn't what they had been called to do. It was their responsibility to give themselves to prayer and the word. They didn't consider themselves too good or too important for that kind of service. But they recognized that this was not the ministry to which God had called them. So, let's notice what they did. And may we learn a lesson from this. 
they uh, appointed several trusted men to oversee the needs of widows so that the teaching elders might give themselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And God blessed them in a wonderful way. And verse 7 tells us that the word of God spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a number of priests became obedient to the faith. Having properly delegated the responsibility of meeting the physical needs of the people to a group of deacons, the apostles as men sent from God to bear witness to the light gave themselves wholly to their task of praying and preaching. And as a result, the word of God spread. And the number of disciples increased rapidly. So, when you are asked to take on a responsibility or, or you recognize a need for a specific ministry, take time to consider if that is a prompting from God for you. Don't let your default response be, let the pastor do it. That's his job, what he's getting paid for. Rather, do your part and help the man sent from God so that he can more effectively bear witness to the light. Every Christian should want to help his pastor in, in such a way that together they can fulfill the work of the church. He and the church need you. Together, we and you can do great things for God. We had some missionaries from Ecuador speak at our church once and they said this. You may be familiar. God does not call the qualified. He, call, he qualifies the called. So let me say again, when you are asked to do something for the church family or church ministry, give it serious consideration. Don't dismiss it outright because you aren't qualified or that you don't have educa education for that. You really wouldn't or you really just would rather not. God will bless you if it's done in his name and for his glory. Help in whatever way you can so that your pastor may be released to form, perform his ministry in the manner God desires. We are so blessed in this church to have many capable and willing servants. People who spend countless hours preparing for and serving our church family. For you who sacrifice your time with your family, uh, with your families and from your families and your recreational activities in order to prepare a sermon, teach a class, mow the lawn, shovel snow, lead a youth activity, many more, and whatever you do, thank you. I pray that God will bring a special blessing to you and your families. And to those of us who benefit from their sacrifice, I would encourage you to express your appreciation to them. Pastor Mark and Kim have been here for four years. I thought that's what it was. He is beginning to know us and we are beginning to know them. I want to suggest uh, some things that you can do to care for them. One of the most important things you can do is pray for them. Pray for God's leading, strengthening, direction, and discernment. Pray for Kim and their children, their financial needs, their health. And as you get to know them more, you will discover more ways that you can pray for them. Secondly, respect his time and their time together. Somehow, uh, some have the idea that a preacher only works a couple hours on Sunday morning. This is just not the case. Pastor Mark and Kim need time together. They need time with their children. Please, get, please give consideration to that before you call them at 9.30 at night or 6.30 in the morning. If you put your minds to it, I'm sure there are some very practical things that each of you can do to help our pastor. Certainly, there are the obvious ones, such as teaching, serving on communities, mowing the lawn, shoveling snow, so many other things. As a body, we can take care of many needs of the church and the church family. There are other very practical things that you can for, uh, do for them. Are you going to Salt Lake for the day? How about checking to see if there's something you can pick up for them? If you're fixing a casserole for the freezer, how about fixing... One for their freezer as well. After you get that elk all ready for the freezer, how about sharing some of those steaks with your pastor and his family? <laughs> I'm sure you can come up with many more and better ideas than I. 
The goal is to care for our pastor, not just for now, but for all the years that God gives him to us. Seek God's direction on how you can be a giver to our pastor as well as a receiver of his gifts and ministry. And in closing, I want to remind you of three re- of the three responsibilities that you have toward our pastor. As a man, he needs your prayers. As a man sent from God, he deserves your respect. As a man sent from God to bear witness of the light, he needs and deserves your help. Do your best to meet your responsibilities, and I might add, your privileges in serving God together with Pastor Mark and Kim.